Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you here this morning. Listen, if you were excited about, uh, about um, fall getting here, uh, you have been blessed. So we, I mean, you just wonder if it's ever going to get there, and then all of a sudden, bang, it happens, and that's kind of the way Idaho works in our world to today. Anyway, it's good to see you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know that you are a welcome guest and that we're really happy that you've chosen to come and spend these moments of worshiping God together with us this morning, so welcome. Uh, please stay around a little bit after services and give us a chance to... Uh, get to uh, meet you and say hi to you. I noticed last week there were a, a number of faces that were unfamiliar to me, and I see the same this morning. And last week, I really wanted to be able to get to you and say hi to you, but um, our service kind of ended a little bit different than we thought it would. But anyway, uh, uh, please stay around a little bit after services and give us a chance to say hi uh, to you. Uh, it's good to see you. Before I get into the lesson, let me just share with you about our upcoming lectureship that's coming in October the uh, 13th through the uh, 15th. It's going to be a great lectureship. We have some incredible guys who are going to be speaking uh, to us. In your boxes in the uh, hallway, you might notice that there is a schedule of the various uh, um, topics that these guys are going to be speaking on, as well as the men who are going to be speaking. Let me encourage you to be here. They're going to be talking about the subject of Say Something. I think in our world today, you know, there is a need to say something about all that's going on around us. Certainly there's a need to say something about God's grace, about his love, about his forgiveness, but also to recognize that, you know, to say something about the, the wrath that is to come as well, and to say something about the moral condition of our world, to say something about the value of every human being. Uh, those are going to be, I think, timely topics for our day and age, and so I would really encourage you to set aside that Thursday evening and, and all day Friday and Saturday, and then we'll end on Sunday. It's going to be a great time together with one another. Let me begin by dis the lesson by sharing with you some trivia. So who do you think or who do you know was the first man who set foot on, uh, the, uh, on the moon? Any guesses there? Well, if you said, well, it was Neil Armstrong in 1970, 1969, you would have been right. He's the first man to set foot on the moon. Since that time, 24 men have landed on the moon. 12 of them have walked. So here's another question for you. Who was the last man to set foot on the moon? And that's a little bit more hard, isn't it? That's a little bit more difficult. You know, Neil Armstrong kind of is, is a well-known character, but this guy here is not as well-known, yet he was the last man. Eugene or Gene Cernan, he was the last man who set foot on the moon on, uh, with Apollo 17 on December the 11th, 1972. Now, two men walked on the planet on, that, on the moon that day. There was a fellow by the name of Jack Schmidt. He walked on the moon at the same time that Gene Sermon was, but Jack Schmidt got into the lunar lander before Gene did, so he's the last man to set foot on the moon. So he's the last man, not as well known as Neil Armstrong, but nevertheless, he has an important part in the history of the lunar landings that were there. You see, we are people who really like first things. We like first things, and seldom do we think of last things. For instance, who was the first person to break the four-minute mile? Well, Roger Bannister, he broke the four-minute mile. I think he, he did it in three minutes, 59 seconds, 0.4 seconds. But since that time, there have been a lot have done them. In fact, there has been 1,664 individuals who have broke the four-minute mile, and it is the standard now for mid-distance runners. But who was the last one to do it? Well, no one knows, or at least I haven't really thought about who the guy is that, that did it. Or what about this person, Sir Edmund Hillary, was the first man to climb the, the, to the summit of Mount Everest. And since that time, there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of people who have climbed Mount Everest. In fact, they have all kinds of reality shows now about climbing Mount Everest, and there is always a crowd of people trying to get to the crest or to the peak of that, that thing, leaving oxygen bottles and all kinds of trash everywhere around. But we don't think of the last ones to climb Mount Everest. We think of the first. And so we think of first, seldom do we think of last. We, in the last several months, have been in an endeavor to know uh, Jesus better. In fact, that's been our theme for the year. And in the midst of that theme, as we try to come to be, uh, have a more intimate knowledge and a relationship with Jesus, I've been sharing with you some a small series. And one of the series that I've been sharing with you it has to do with the I Am passages. And so far, we have looked at seven of the I Am passages that are recorded in the Gospel of John. 
in, 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 in these passages, we've been trying to learn some things about Jesus. And what we try to learn is, is what is the significant thing that Jesus is trying to reveal to himself about himself, to us? What is he trying to show us about him, himself? And then secondly, what significant application to our life is Jesus trying to reveal to us? How can we apply these I am passages to our lives? We began by looking at John, the 8th chapter in verse 48, where Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. He's claiming divinity. He's claiming to be a God. He's claiming to be existent way before Abraham was, that Abraham longed to see his day, but before Abraham was, I am. And he used those words that, you know, that God spoke to Moses from the burning bush. When he says, who should I say sent me? You tell him, I am that I am has sent you. So Jesus is almost shouting forth through the I am statements recorded by John that he's more than just a man, that he is definitely deity or that he is definitely God. And so we began by looking at the bread of life in John, the sixth chapter. From the bread of life, we learned that just as you know, physical bread is important to nourishing our physical bodies, so Jesus is the bread of life to our spiritual bodies. He's necessary for him to be a part in our life. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. We live in a dark world, and so to be able to navigate through this darkness, Jesus becomes that light, and he shows us how to navigate through this life into eternity itself. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He wants us to know that just as he resurrected from the grave, that's our promise as well. And so we have this hope for those of our loved ones who have died and gone on before us, that we will see them again. But more importantly than that, that we ourselves, that this is not the end of life when we lose our lives. We have life beyond this life. In fact, it truly is the beginning of eternal life. Jesus said, I am the door. By saying the door, he said that I am the way into salvation. I am the way into protection, that I am the door. He said, I am the good shepherds. Hiring, hiring, hirelings, uh, they are only around as long as they are being paid, but they're not going to give your, their lives for you. I'm here as a good shepherd. I will lay down my life for you. I'll protect you. I'll provide for you. I'll sacrifice for you. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, truth, and the life. How does one come to the Father? Jesus said, I am that way. I am that truth. I am that life. Put your trust and your confidence in me. And then finally, which has been probably a month and a half ago, we looked at Jesus saying, I am the true vine. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And what he was trying to say to us is that, there is no life outside of being connected to that, that vine, that he is the life source. And if we hope to live and to bear fruit in our lives, then we have to have a relationship with him. We need to be connected to the vine. That brings us to the eighth I am and final I am sec, uh, uh, declare, uh, declaration that Jesus made concerning himself. But it's not found in the gospel of John. It's found in the other book that is offered by John in the book of Revelation. Now, sometimes when we look at the book of Revelation, it becomes a little bit scary to us. Um, think about the last time you got in devotionally and just read through the book of Revelation. Seldom do we do that because of a little bit of a fear factor that was there. It's like the little girl who was helping her mom prepare dinner, and as they were preparing dinner, the mom says to the little girl, she goes, go into the pantry and bring me a can of tomatoes. The little girl says, I'm afraid to go into that pantry. It's dark in there. And, and she said, well, you don't have to worry about it because you'll be protected because Jesus is in there. So the little girl looks somewhat skeptical at her mom, but she walks over to the pantry, and she opens the door, and she looks into the darkness of it, and then steps back, and she says, Jesus, if you are in there, hand me a can of tomatoes. <laughs> well, why? Well, she was afraid. And sometimes when we look at the book of Revelation, that's how we are. We're a little bit, afraid. it's a little scary, but it's got a lot of different kinds of images, strange images that are, are there. But listen, the book of Revelation, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing scary about that book unless you're one who denies Jesus Christ as being the son of God. Then you got a problem. But other than that, the book of Revelation is a book of encouragement and victory for the faithful believers uh, who are, are facing persecution. 
For faithful believers, it's a great book because it is a book of victory. It says we win no matter what happens in life. We are the winners of, of that very thing. You see, the church is getting ready to go through some persecution. Well, it's already been a persecution, but it's going to get really severe. And so John, or Jesus, reveals to John what is to come so that they can be prepared for what is going to happen there, okay? Now, Owen, he read to us a few moments ago from Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and so you might want to open your Bibles to that section of Scripture. Now, this is not an expository lesson where I'm going to go down through and 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 expose all eight of those verses. There's one that I have in mind that I think is important when it comes to the I am statements of, of Jesus, okay? Before I get to though, let me just share with you some background. The background is this. You recall that Jesus has chosen 12 men, kind of a ragtag bunch, to be his apostles, to be his messengers. He's going to spend three years with them, educating them and, and strengthening them and, and building them up. He's getting, he's getting them ready to become those who are going to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the world. They'll become the, the pillars of the church. He'll choose four of them are going to be fishermen. One's going to be a tax gatherer. One's going to be a zealot. Uh, one is going to be a father's son. Thing. There's, there, listen, there's going to be a different kind of group of people, and they're going to go. As John receives this revelation and begins to pin this down, it's been 60 years. 60 years since Jesus ascended into heaven. And by this time, the gospel has spread to the entire known world. It's spread. But it has not spread without there being a tremendous sacrifice and a lot of blood being spilled. In fact, John, as he finds himself on the island of Patmos, because of preaching the gospel, he's now an old man. Some say he might be close into his 90s. He's an old man. And he has been witness and is aware of, you know, 12, 11 of his best friends in the world. They have died because of the faith. Peter, Andrew, James, and, and John and the others have all been killed. They've died for the message of Jesus Christ. So through that 60 years, there's been some heartache that has been there. There's been some hurt that has been there. And there's Christians who have died because of their faith. And now John is on the island of Patmos, which is a penal colony for the Romans. It's a small island outside of the Aegean Sea, just south of what is modern-day Turkey. Today, he, he's there. He's an old man. But white hot within his heart burns his knowledge of Jesus Christ and his relationship with Jesus Christ. And it burns with a white hot fierceness when it comes down to the word of God. And he won't shrink back from it. And that's where John is as he pins these words. And, and as he's pinning the words, it says later on that as he beheld the one, which was Jesus, it says that he fell down as though he were dead. And then Jesus put his hand on him and reassures him of some things. But in the midst of all this, he hears these incredible words that are found in verse 8. The words were this, booming loud from heaven, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. These are incredible words. So what were they, they saying? Well, the words are, if you didn't catch it, was I am. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. Now, to us, in our, as English people and those who speak English, it doesn't have as much meaning as maybe to those back then. But when they heard those words, Alpha and Omega, they're going to get it right away because they know that Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. It's like me saying from A to Z, from beginning to end, you know, from uh, Albania to Zimbabwe. From aardvarks to zebras, it is the entirety, but it's more than just letters. It's a reality that is being spoken here. So what's being saying is that God is, Jesus is revealing to John that God is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the ever-present being. Now, if you were to look at several passages of Scripture, for instance, Isaiah the prophet wrote in Isaiah 44 and verse 6, this is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and the last. Apart from me, there is no God. In another place, Isaiah 41 and verse 4, who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, with the first 
I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am he. God is saying that he has ever always been present. And then Moses in the, in the psalm said these words in Psalm 98 verses 1 and 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Now listen to this. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He's saying he's ever been. That God is everything. Think about this question. Where did God come from? Little children will sometimes ask that question. You know, Papa, where did God come from? And you say to them, well, God has always been. And you can see the little brain start to spin. What do you mean he has always been? That has been humanity's question. It's been humanity's struggle. It's always been uh, how to understand how God has always been. From little children to high school students, to college students, to greatest thinkers throughout time, they've asked that question, where did God come from? It's a question that I ask myself. And my guess is that almost every single one of you in here this morning have asked that question, where did God come from? Because it hurts our brains when we hear the answer, he has always been. Because we are people who are locked into time, space, and matter, where we are three-dimensional people who live for the moment in the day, and our years are numbered. To think of a being that is eternal, to think of a being who has ever been or has always been, blows our, our minds. But great thinkers, like I said, have talked about God. Uh, Aristotle talked about the un unmoved mover. And in it, he says, not only is he the unmoved mover, but he moves through love. Now, I'm not saying that Aristotle was saying this is talking about God, but he does understand the idea of cause and effect. He says, if you prove the cause, you at once prove the effect. And conversely, nothing can exist without its cause. He would only say, something or someone by which everything else is made and owes its existence to. The unmoved mover, the cause... We are the effect. The world is the effect. Now, in Aristotle, he talked about four causes, okay? Well, this is one of the causes, the unmoved a mover. Or how about Voltaire? Voltaire was an unabashed atheist. He really was. Listen to his words. The world embarrasses me, and I can't dream that this watch exists and has no watchmaker. Even Voltaire, who does not believe in God, says, things do not just happen. Watches do not just happen. This earth, this planet, this world in which we live, human beings don't just happen. There was a cause behind that. And he may not recognize it as being God, but he, also, but he certainly does recognize that there is a watchmaker. There is a cause. Or maybe Isaac Newton of fame with the apple falling from the tree and, and gravity says, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel um, and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. God. He's always existed. He has been, always been. We may not be able to completely get our minds around that or understand how everyone else has a beginning, but he does not that hurts our heads. And so when, when John comes along and he writes those words, I am the Alpha and the Omega, he's talking about God's ever-present reality. The Alpha and the Omega. So what is, he, what is it that we're trying to learn from this? Well, I think it's, it's not hard, I don't think. I think it's fairly simple. What Jesus is saying is that God is in complete control of everything. That he's sovereign over everything, that nothing happens without him allowing it to happen or causing it to happen. God is sovereign. He knows the beginning and he knows the end. He knows everything about what is happening in our lives. And so when we say to ourselves, I'm worried about the future, God says, don't worry about the future. I've been there. I'm the Alpha. I'm the Omega. And just as God is the Alpha and the Omega... So is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. There are four verses I want you just to take note of, okay? You can follow along in your, in your Bibles as you open them, but we're going to rapidly move through these. 
The first one is if you just kind of skip down from verse 8 where God says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, and come down to verse 17 and 18. John has seen this man who's clothed in brightness and this amazing figure, which is the son of man, which is, is Jesus himself. And he says, then I saw him. I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever and hold the keys to death and Hades. This was found in Revelation 2, verses 8 and 9, to the angel of the church of Smyrna. Remember, this book is written to the seven churches of Asia. To the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. As we move forward very quickly to Revelation chapter 21, verses 6 through 8, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give, uh, give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Revelation 22, verses 12 through 13. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. All four of those verses have one thing in common. It's talking about Jesus Christ. And just as God is the Alpha and the Omega, the ever-present one who has always been, that's what Jesus is saying about himself. Jesus is saying, I have always been. So when you look at passages like, before Abraham was, I am, he is saying, I am eternal. And that's what he's shouting forth when we say forth that I am the bread of life, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the true vine, I am. He's shouting forth to those who are listening to him, I'm God. I am God. So Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is God. In fact, when you look at the scriptures, if you were to look at John 1 and verse 1, that passage of scripture, in fact, I'd invite you to open your Bibles to that section of scripture. John 1 and verse 1, there he says um, that uh, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. It doesn't say a God. The definite article is simply not there, okay? So he says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Look at verse 2 and 3. He, that's the Word, who was God, he was in the beginning with God. All things came to, into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. What is he saying? What he's saying is that Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, Jesus, who is the Word, who is God, was the creator of the world in which we live. All things were made by him. So how do we know that the word is God and how do we know it's Jesus? Look at verse 14. And the word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Look at verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So what is he saying to us? He's saying that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He has always been, just as his father has always been, and that he is the creator of the world in which we live. It echoes Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was time. God was the fourth, created energy. He made the heavens, that space. He made the earth, that's matter. And then you go on and you find out, and he spoke every part of the world into existence. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then he says, let's make the man, and then they made the man. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. In the image of God, he made them male and female, he created them. Both plural and senior pronouns are you speaking of the God who's made up the more than just of one. God the Father and God the Son, both the Alpha and the Omega. So what does that mean to us that Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega? The same thing that is said about God. Jesus is saying that as God, he is in complete 
control. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. He knows everything about what is going on in our lives. Think about the song that we just sang just a few moments ago. In the song, we sang these words, Christ above me, Christ beside me, Christ within me ever guiding, Christ behind me, Christ before, Christ my love, my life, my Lord. You sang about that. You sang about the Alpha and the Omega. You sang about the one who is always there. And that's what Jesus said, I'm never far away. You can trust me. You can put your life in my hands because I care for you. There's a tremendous amount of comfort that comes because of that very thought there. Let me just break down a little bit Jesus being the Alpha. The Alpha means the beginning. Now, he's the beginning of everything. Like we said, he's the beginning of the creation of everything that we see, the world, okay? But what else is he the beginning of? Well, to me, Jesus has, made, has remade my life so that my life is renewed and re-begun. So back in 1973, as an 18-year-old, I went forward and was baptized into Christ. That remade me. That renewed me. That was the, the new birth that took place. How did that, that happen? Well, Romans 6 and verse 4 says, We were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too, what, might walk in newness of life. And that's exactly what those people asked on the day of Pentecost, that very first day, day one of the church, after they had heard the gospel message of Jesus Christ, it says they were pricked in their hearts, and they said to the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a demarcation line from being dead to being alive, to being old and being renewed, and that's at your baptism. And that's what they did on the day of Pentecost, and that's what many of you, and that's what I did. And we were renewed, and because of that, as was shared with us last Wednesday evening by Jake, he shared with us this passage there in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We have become changed. I was reading a story about a little girl. The story is told that she was wearing a, a bright, shiny cross around her neck that was hooked to a golden chain. It was a pretty little thing. Later on, a, an older man came up to him, and he says, little girl, don't you know that the cross that Jesus died on was not a pretty shiny little thing that's around your neck? It was ugly. It was brutal, and it's made of wood. And the little girl, she was very respectful. She thought about that for a moment, and then she said to the man, she says, I know that, but in Bible school, they have told us that everything that Jesus touches changes. And isn't that true? I mean, there's a part of when we look at the cross that it is ugly and it was brutal and it was humiliating and a lot of terrible things, but also the cross takes a different view to us who are being saved because for us who are being saved, we see God's grace and we see his mercy and we see his love and we see his sacrifice and we see his forgiveness and we see all those things that center around the cross. He touched it and he changed it forever. That's what Jesus has done. Jesus came to change our lives and to offer us a new beginning. He is my alpha. A new beginning, he's your alpha and a new beginning. But he's not finished with us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and finisher of our faith. He's not done with us. Think about this for a second. You know, when you look at some people who are artists, we have some artists in our, our congregation. Uh, Cindy is, is an artist. You know, she, she paints some beautiful things. But artists sometimes, you know, they'll start with something. Maybe it'll be a painting or maybe it'll be a sculpture or something that they're, they're working on. And when they're working on those things, you know, um, they're, they, they really work hard at their craft. But sometimes they say, okay, I, I don't know what else to do with this thing. And so enough is enough. It's got to be good enough. And so they settle for good enough and they just stop. But when it comes to your life and mine, I want you to know that Jesus never does that. 
Jesus is never finished with us. We are a workmanship that he's constantly working on, that he's always perfecting, that he's always making better as we come into knowing the image of who Jesus Christ really is and how we can be transformed in that kind of an, an image. That's what it is. Now, there are some artists that are like that. There are some artists that, you know, when they work on something, they work until they almost have perfection. Uh, there are some like that. For instance, Leonardo da Vinci, he was kind of like that. He's one of these guys who work hard at something towards perfection. And so let me give you a quiz, okay? What is the most recognized, valuable, priceless a painting that you can think of? Well, if you're saying, well, it's the uh, Mona Lisa, you'd be right. And so, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, he paints the Mona Lisa. He, he did it because a patron of his said that he wanted a, a painting for a birthday gift. Now, if, if Leonardo da Vinci was all about money, he could have done that in like a month, right? But, he, but to Leonardo da Vinci, it was never about money to him. It was about his passion for, for painting and for artistry and things like that. And so he never settled for anything less than perfect. And so when it came down to the Mona Lisa, did you know that it took him four years to paint this? Four years to paint that. Why? Why did it take so long? Because he's looking for perfection. In fact, they say that there are 30 layers of paint on the Mona Lisa. 30 layers of paint. So what's going on here? Well, he had paint one part of it, and then he would sit back and look. He said, no, I don't like that. It's not good enough. Then he'd go back and repaint it again. And then he'd sit back and look. And he said, no, I don't like that. And, and he did that for four years until when he is finished, he has the Mona Lisa. I've seen the thing in the Louvre there in Paris. It's not near as big. It's only like this big here. You know, it's a small thing. But, I mean, they, when they talk about perfection in artistry, that's it. That's God working in our lives. That's God working. He's never through with us. He never gets up on us. He's always dabbing a little bit here and dabbing a little bit there. He's always renewing us and remaking us. He's always building us to be the kind of people that he would have us to be. Why? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. God loves us that much. He is the omega. He is the the end. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. I give to every man according to his work, uh, work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Just as Jesus brought about the beginning of the world, he'll bring about the end. When he returns, it is over. It is done. There is an end game, okay? And it has two scenarios. One, one ends in everlasting destruction. And we look at the passage of Scripture that talks about that. When Jesus is revealed with his angels with flaming fire, dealing out retribution on those who do not know God and those who have not obeyed the gospel. That's what 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 7 through 8 talks about there. Or Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15 describes a, a, uh, a judgment scene that is almost beyond imagination or description ending with a lake of fire to those who have not been obedient and those who have not lived upright lives the other scenario is the one that ends in everlasting life in heaven hebrews the 12th chapter in verse 2 says fixing our eyes on jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith who the joy set before him endured the cross despised the shame and sat down at the right hand of god or the throne of god so where is jesus he's in heaven He's one way to prepare a place for us, John the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 6 tells us. And so those are the two scenarios, and, and we get to choose. God doesn't force us into the, either one of those. He allows us to choose where we want to spend eternity, but he places before us the Alpha and the Omega and tells us to choose. I thought about Neil Armstrong, what it must have been like to set foot on the moon. No man had ever done that. Do you think there was a little bit of faith that had to take place there? Would it be solid? What would it be like? What would it feel like? And I thought just as Neil Armstrong took that step, that maybe that's what we need to do as well. Maybe that's what you need to do this morning. Maybe you need to make a step of 
of faith. It's an eternal step and begins uh, to, to begin anew knowing that your end will be eternal life. And it'll be the first and last best step you'll ever take until this one step you take as you enter into heaven. And so the opportunity is being given to you. So how do you make that step? Well, you make that step, first of all, by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is the Alpha and the Omega. Secondly, you not only come to that belief, but you're willing to acknowledge that fact that he is the son of the living God, that he is the Alpha and the Omega, that he is the Lord, that he is the resurrected one, and that you're willing to acknowledge that by confessing him as such. What else do we need to do? Well, you need to repent. You need to make a, a change, a reverse course, as you step in the ways that Jesus would have you to step. The Bible would call that repentance. And then, of course, to take the step into baptism where one is immersed for the remission of our sins, just like they did on the day of Pentecost, as they recognize Jesus as being the Alpha and the Omega. And so it's your choice this morning. Your steps are your steps. While together we stand and sing and give you opportunity.